York Times best-selling author John Gilstrap. Mr. Gilstrap. Good morning. And Jefferson County prosecuting attorney, though he's not here in that particular role, Mr. Matt Harvey. Matthew. Good morning. Good to be back. Good to see your smiling face. Uh, it's good to be smiling. Oh, good to have you here smiling. Enough of that already. Uh, we have, uh, obviously, just a few days left until Election Day, May 14th. I just realized, did you know that there's an election coming up? This is election heard. season? You may have heard. Whoa. A few commercials here or there. And we're grateful for those, by the way. Early voting ends May the 11th, and of course, Election Day is uh, May the 14th. We'll be going until 11 each morning, as we have been all week long. We'll do it again tomorrow and Monday and at least Tuesday of next week as well. Let's welcome in our first guest on the program, Judge David Camaletti. Judge, good morning. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you very much for having me. Good morning to everybody. Good morning good to, to you. Good to be here. Yeah. Uh, you are seeking another term as judge. When did you first sit on the bench, sir? I was appointed uh, back in 2015 and for a uh, uh, judge who left before his term ended, and then I was elected in 2016, so it's eight years later, and all of a sudden, it's time for another election. Why have you decided to run for re-election? Uh, b- because I'm not ready to retire is probably the most important answer. I'm going to be 68 this year been practicing law since 1982 and a judge for the last eight and a half, nine years. Um, but I'm still going strong, so it would make no sense to give up now and you, keep going. You're in Family Court Circuit 24, Division 1? That is, that's the moniker that they give us. It's, it's a, I'm a family court judge. There's uh, about 47 of us across the state, and next year there'll be 48. We're getting an extra one here in the eastern panhandle. Um, uh, and I, the, the Division One is merely administrative to delineate the way that we vote for judges in this state. Um, so there's uh, uh, four divisions running for family court judge this time. I think there's six divisions for circuit court judge, and uh, I, I, I think there are. Well, in January well, 1st, there'll be Jefferson County will have yeah, two divisions. That's right. So yes, the, yeah. the, right now the family court and the circuit court that those circuits don't necessarily over they don't overlap, overlap. exactly it's, uh, one of the curiosities Morgan's carved out into a, correct another one of the curiosities line. of the family court was they did not follow the lines of the circuit courts <clears throat> and while that on its face seems a little um odd uh in the in the uh planning of it all it was much more uh, about populations and about how much work could be done and where these judges would have to travel. And, of course, since they only started family court judges in about uh, uh, 2000, 2002, uh, they had um, a lot of, of uh, prior history to, uh, to lean on for how the circuits had worked. And it's hard to change those circuits once you establish them. For so, us lay folks, what is the difference between this, with this, the circuit court and the family courts? What for the- jurisdictional purposes, the circuit court handles the largest array of all kinds of cases uh, that can be brought to court, both criminal and civil, and including some family court matters. They also, and most importantly, the circuit court handles abuse and neglect cases, and the family court explicitly does not handle abuse and neglect cases. They're only handled by the circuit court. The family court then handles divorces and custody and a child support and um, the uh, domestic violence as a protective order comes to the family court. But domestic violence as a criminal matter remains with uh, the magistrate court and the circuit court if necessary. So, so is the family court is more civil matters than criminal matters? Well, it's all civil. The family court does not deal with any criminal matter per se, although you could still get in trouble in family court if you were enough of a bad actor. Uh, but for real criminal things, that's going to go both to the magistrates and to the circuit courts. So your name will be on the ballot for every voter in Berkeley and Jefferson? Correct. And- we are um, on the nonpartisan ballot. And if anybody who's looked at the ballot choices or gone to their early voting already, you'll notice that there's a nonpartisan ballot. And then there's also, of course, a party ballots. The nonpartisan has only those um, uh, those uh, uh, people who are um, – uh, not uh, affiliated with a party uh, for election purposes, and that's mainly judges. 
uh, school board, I think, is involved in that and some other matters. And then uh, the Democratic ballot will include the nonpartisans and the Republican ballot will include the nonpartisans. And an independent voter could um, could choose either one of those uh, to vote. And this is the final election for judges. There's no November yes, that's election for the primary judges. is the final. And uh, uh, that has been going on since 2016 uh, when they changed those rules about party affiliation. All right, and I have to ask you about the thing that happened in 2022. You were mm -hmm. sanctioned for, um, uh, I can't find the wording right here, but essentially inappropriate comments made in the courtroom and, yes. and suspension. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, back in 2021, when the events occurred, um, I had taken on both the duties of my own court and the duties of the judge in Jefferson County who was uh, leaving at the time. Uh, as well, I had experienced some significant um, uh, issues in my own life, uh, mainly the deaths of people that I had not completely finished dealing with. And I t took that out on the litigants in my courtroom to a high degree, and it became uh, noticeable and, um, quite frankly, it was uh, unacceptable. And I was called out for it. And as I say, this happened pretty much in 21, as I was uh, making the change from Berkeley to Jefferson. Uh, the uh, the way that the system works for uh, uh, investigating and um, uh, resolving those issues took about a year. So it was in 22 that I actually took a suspension, uh, 30 days uh, off the bench uh, without pay um, as a, a, a re resolution to those matters. I, as well, I was uh, uh, sanctioned um, uh, and... Uh, uh, that is one of those issues that, that, that does remain with you uh, even after the event is over. Did that affect the outcome of the cases that were involved? No, I don't think it did. Um, uh, they probably, and I can't say this for sure, uh, in that in the time period running up to there, I had handled over those years uh, over 9,000 matters, 9,000 hearings. So I can't say for sure which matters they were, but I'm pretty sure they had to do with child support mostly. At least one of them I know had to do with actual uh, child custody, um, and that's typically where the hot points come in anyway. People that don't pay their child support chronically can become um, uh, annoying. And uh, I allowed my personal uh, emotion to override my judicial temperament, which is required at all times. Um, and I uh, uh, lashed out in open court and meant to at the time. I did it intentionally, and that was wrong. And I was, uh, you know, called out for it. Mr. There I am, Mr. Harvey. Your Honor, um, what is the lion's share of the cases that you deal with in family court? The lion's share is probably the wrong term because it seems to be such a mix certainly we do divorces and people have their own view of what a divorce is but we do as probably as many divorces with no children or for people whose children have already attend uh, aged out meaning they're over 18 as we do for people that have young children or children under 18 uh, as well we do a whole lot of child custody for people who were never married and that is a huge part of the of the uh, system as well uh, you also do the comebacks, the uh, modifications of custody and child support forever or until the children are at least 18 and graduated from high school. And um, those take up a, a, a large amount of your time. People change, children change, and their situation requires some adjustment from time to time. Uh, we also do uh, some domestic violence protective orders. Um, and uh, another hot topic, grandparent visitation, which is not as easy or as straightforward as it sounds. But uh, all those things combined make up a docket. So I can't say that there's a lie and share, but if you had a particular interest, I could probably... Well, <laughs> what, what I was trying to get at is, is and that makes sense for, for your answer, but is there, is there any patterns developing of, of trends that you see in society that reflect in the <clears> docket? <throat> The most important trend that I see is uh, people are coming in without lawyers, what we call pro se. And that's a word that you and I toss around yeah. uh, easily enough, but 
uh, pro se simply means that they're acting on their own without lawyers. In family court especially, um, number one, it's a confidential court. It is not something that can be um, published, what is occurring. Uh, but more importantly, we don't let anybody else in but the litigants and their lawyers. Nobody gets to come in. Okay, So if you're there without a lawyer, you're on your own. And, and uh, people are, of course, unfamiliar with the processes, um, and they, uh, they can flounder uh, in those situations, especially if there's complicated issues, which there uh, are most of the time. There's going to be something that's difficult to handle, and if you just... You know, if you're acting without a lawyer, you're going to have to figure it out yourself. It's, it's not the judge's job to guide the person who comes in without an attorney. That's a, 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 the way you said it, Rob. Um, it is certainly the judge's job to guide how courtroom proceedings occur. It's not the judge's job to tell them what to do, to give them um, advice other than this is how we're going to proceed. You may want to consider that. Here are the choices that might be able to be made, but you're going to have to make your own choices. I can't make your choices. I can rule on your issues, though. And I will rule on your issues the way I see them uh, as you try to present them to me. Does a judge factor in a little understanding or sympathy for the person who doesn't have an attorney who's going up against somebody who is actually there with a very sharp attorney? Um, being a human being, I would say that it would be hard-pressed for anybody uh, as a judge not to um, have in their mind the uh, unequalness of somebody who comes in with a lawyer versus somebody who comes in without a lawyer. And while you may say, I act impartial at all times and I would never give either side an advantage, I believe that the human side of you is going to allow for some type of of understanding that these people are here without a lawyer the other side has a lawyer let's make sure nothing goes too far one way the principal uh, aspect of domestic court a family court is to have equity to have fairness and of course when there's children to, for the best interest of the children so you can't let a lawyer override those those more important virtues. So know. I see a continuum here, and I'm, I'm curious where there's the crossover. Yeah. When somebody is arrested for a, domestic a, violence, well, for a criminal act, okay. and mom and dad, or mom or dad, are sent to jail, now we've created foster children. Does, do then those essentially functional orphans, do they then end up in family court? Do you become part of the foster you've, system? You've probably... Uh, conflated a, a lot of law all into one okay. situation. It's not that that situation didn't occur either at my time or, or Matt's. Um, if one party goes to jail, you always have the other party, unless that other party has already absented themselves, which nowadays is often the case. Typically, you're going to have either a, a very close friend or a relative who has already stepped into place without any help from the courts, and that's probably been going on since the birth of the child anyway. If it comes to court in those fashions, it's often done as a guardianship, um, not to be confused with guardian ad litems, who are lawyers. A guardianship is a process both for uh, children and for uh, older people who have, may need help, uh, where another person, usually a relative, comes in and takes over legally for the needs of that person. That's not the same as foster care. Foster care uh, usually is going to occur um, uh, when there has been uh, some type of, of abuse and neglect, usually, that is in the circuit court, and those children have been taken from their parents or their parents have been uh, indicated to be unfit to have them at the time, and the foster care system is going to be involved. Very, It's less likely that the foster care system will be directly involved in the family court. Uh, we might get it as a matter of families breaking up, but not in the direct sense. If that helps to start that, mm -hmm. there's many, many other answers that could be made in that line. But. Yeah, I'm always, this idea coming from Virginia until a few years ago, this whole idea of electing judges is kind mm -hmm. of new to me. So, yes. yeah, they appoint them yeah, in Virginia. Right. The legislature appoints them. Yeah. And the, the idea of coming into a ballot box and you know, running for, for, for judge, 
you know, hang them high. I mean, there's really no platform for, for, for judges. So what should people think about when they're alone in the ballot box? What are the elements that people should weigh in their minds about who do I want to have well, as, as my judge? Uh, you know, it, it's easy for somebody who's been through the legal process, through school, to say, well, all of us should go to the ballot box with a clear idea of who the candidates are, and we should all have done our homework, and we should know what these people stand for. Well, that's not going to happen. People, if, they're, if they bother to go to the ballot box, which we all understand is an issue, um, it's because they found the time to do so, either in early voting or uh, 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 by showing up on the day, which many of us used to wait for like it was a magic day. But that's one group of Americans who love the whole process and love to go to, uh, to vote for who they want. Um, but anybody who goes in is most likely going to say, oh, I don't even know who these people are. Who am I going to vote for? And I would love for everybody to have done the homework and for us to have educated them how we could have, but that's lost on a lot of folks. So I think that people just have to use their, their best feelings. They have to use your gut. You're going into the ballot box. You may or may not have heard about these people. You may or may not have heard about issues about the whole situation. You just have to use your best sense. And I know that that's not the best answer that might have been given, but it's the answer that I can tell you is what's going to happen when they get in there. Judge David Camaletti, our guest here on the program, running for uh, re-election in family court. Uh, Judge, we have about uh, a minute and a half left or so. Take a moment and tell the folks out there why they should re-elect you. I became a lawyer in 1982 and practiced law for 33 years before I went on the bench. I practiced every kind of law there was. I came from a family of lawyers. Um, since I've been on the bench uh, in family court, I've tried to uh, move the cases forward to make sure people didn't linger, languish in court, but got their cases heard. And that's been a primary focus of the, my first eight and a half years, is to make sure that the docket ran. Set cases, hear cases, write orders. That's what we've done. Our docket is up to date and has been for many years now, and we can, will continue to do so. Um, I primarily sit in Jefferson County now, but I'm elected in both Berkeley and Jefferson County. I think that overall, I have performed correctly, and I will intent in, in, uh, endeavor to continue to perform correctly in the courts, both in Berkeley and Jefferson County. So I'm going to ask everybody directly, yes, please re-elect me, Dave Camaletti, uh, because I'm doing a good job, and I'm probably the best person for the job. Thank you. Do, you. do you bring your guitar to the courtroom? It's a banjo, and you should know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, thank you, and good luck to you. Where, thank you very much. Where are your people from in Italy? My folks come from uh, the province of Abruzzi, uh, which is on the uh, west or the eastern side, on the western side of the Adriatic. And some came from the coast, and some came from the mountains, but all in the uh, uh, that area of Abruzzi. And if anybody who knows Italy. You know that Abruzzi is obviously the best province, but <laughs> if you can only get to one of those other places, that Rome or Florence thing, go ahead and go there too. They're, they're a lot of fun. Great to see you, Judge. Thank Thanks you so much, much for coming in. You all have a good time. Judge David Camaletti. Hear ye, hear ye. The Colts in session. Right. The Colts in session. This segment of our show today brought to